Greetings, family. Welcome back to the African Exodus show. I'm your host, Tuni Sheree, here to you with a new video. Before we get started with today's show, just as a reminder to you, if you wish to follow this channel and get notifications anytime that I upload a video directly to your phone, you can subscribe to my Telegram channel. In addition, if you feel led to support this channel, you can do so through Cash App and also you can do so through PayPal at the link that's inside of the description. In addition, you can subscribe to my Patreon. There I also post any of the PDFs or articles that I use. I will be posting the ones from this presentation also on my Patreon. We began our talk last time in this weather forecast segment speaking about the matrix, the fact that those of us who are still living inside of the West, those of us who are going through the motions of living the Western lifestyle, and in particular, I've spoken about the American lifestyle, are really inside of a matrix because ultimately the whole point of the American system is to export. The biggest export inside of the United States is the military industrial complex, which is how the United States manages to control so many aspects of the world, even though the United States population is only about 5% of the world population. Now, as I said last time in the video, I want to, this video to be devoted more so to us understanding how we have been manipulated into this system, how we have been sucked into the system, and how the analogy used in the matrix of human batteries actually applies to people who are living in the West. Now, I will say this especially applies to people who are being exploited inside of the West. And we know most people who are the most exploited people inside of America in particular are people who are of African descent. And that is because every single statistic, statistic that you look at, whether it's statistic for poverty, statistic for homelessness, statistic for healthcare, any statistic that you look at, you're going to see that those people are going to be the worst off. So this human battery analogy applies to all of America, but it especially applies to us who are of African descent living inside of the West. So let's get into the whole concept that I wanted to make this around. So many of you probably heard during the pandemic that there was a proclamation put out by the World Economic Forum. And one of the numerous things that they said will be in, in place by 2030 is that essentially you will own nothing and be happy. And this really was a red flag to a lot of people because who wants to hear that you're not going to own anything? Like who's going to be owning things then? Who's going to be the ones controlling things? Who's going to be owning the, the cars, the houses? Who's going to be owning the, the goods? And so a lot of people had alarms about this, but what I want this video to focus on is how we really have been bred into this over time. I mean, this is something that most of us are used to by now because most of us are living realities where we really don't own very much. And the things that traditionally you might have owned, we're seeing more and more us surrendering those typical things to the systems that are making it convenient for us to do so. So I want to start um, this off by first talking about the issue of debt inside of the United States in particular. But again, if this, if you're in a different Western country and this might apply to you, then you know it, it applies to you also. So um, I want to read from this article that just breaks down how much Americans are related with debt. And I think you have to think about parts of your life that you are in debt. Because a lot of parts of our life, it's like you don't think about being in debt because the stigma has been erased. They want you to not feel like you are in debt at that moment. For example, you don't necessarily feel the stigma when it comes to student debt. You know, that's like a investment. Or you don't necessarily feel the stigma for housing debt because that's an investment, right? But it's still debt. And it's still us being in a position where we are actually sitting ducks. Many of us are sitting ducks. Many of us are subjected to... Um, a lot of financial catastrophes whenever we're not aware of the fact that we are still being strangled inside of these different ways economically. So going to this article, the average American has $90,460 in debt. Here's how much Americans have at every age. So it says, while the average American has $90,460 in debt, this includes all types of debt products, including credit cards, personal loans, mortgages, and also student debt. Millennials have seen the largest increase in debt in the last five years. In 2015, the average millennial had about $49,722 in debt, and by 2019, they carried an average of 
78,396 in total debt, an increase of 58%. The youngest consumers, Gen Z, have the lowest overall debt balance on average, but they struggle the most to make payments. About 12.24% of Gen Z's credit card accounts were 30 days or more past due inside of 2019. So it goes through the breakdown, according to um, the breakdown for credit cards, Gen Z or Gen X has the highest credit card balance compared to other age groups at $8,215. For auto loans, Gen X had the highest auto loan balance at $21,570. For mortgage loans, Gen X has the highest average mortgage balance for $238,344. And millennials were a close second at $224,500. And for home equity lines of credit, the average highest for Gen X was $49,221. Now, what's often overshadowed about all of this credit is that there's really high interest rates, particularly for credit cards right now in the United States. It's actually the highest credit card um, crisis that they've had ever. And high interest credit cards, we're talking about 30% interest rates. Really, people are just unable to pay back. Now, there's one type of of credit that was, or one type of debt that was not mentioned inside this article, and I think it's worth talking about, and that is medical debt. Because we're going to tie this into, again, this whole idea of being human batteries, this whole idea that America is purposely trying to deplete you, purposely trying to to suck from you in order to take from you. So just some some quick statistics right quick. This is on medical debt. Despite over 90% of the United States population having some form of health insurance, medical debt remains a persistent problem. For people and families with limited assets, even a relatively small and expected medical expense can be unaffordable. For people with significant medical needs, medical debt can build up over time. People living with cancer, for example, have higher levels of debt than individuals who have never had cancer. Black Americans are far more likely than people of other races and ethnic groups who have high medical debt. This analysis shows that 13% of Black Americans report having medical debt compared to 8% of white and 3% of Asian Americans. Now, the reason I wanted to focus on the medical debt issue is because, if you don't know, the biggest thing that's causing death inside of America is the food industry. The foods, when you go to the store and you buy particularly processed foods, foods that are already made, um, but many foods that you wouldn't even necessarily associate as being unhealthy, these foods have many things wrong with them, have many chemicals inside of them, have many pesticides inside of them. The foods literally are killing many people. So if you're not aware, I'm just going to show you two quick videos. You're getting destroyed and it's very recent and it's accelerating. The stats speak for themselves. You know, you know this very well. 74 percent of Americans are overweight or obese. Uh, 50 percent now of American adults have type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. These were diseases where there was 1 percent of Americans in 1950 had type 2 diabetes. Now it's 50 percent of Americans have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. (sighs) Alzheimer's dementia are going through the roof. Young adult dementias have increased like three times since 2012. So early onset dementias, we're seeing, you know, this one in two Americans are expected to have cancer in their lifetime now, one in two, and young adult cancers are going up 79% in the last 10 years. We've got, of course, the autism rates are absolutely astronomical. One in 36 children has autism now in the United States. That was one in 150 in the year 2000. And in California, where I live, it's one in 22, one in 22 with a lifetime neurodevelopmental disorder. We've got infertility going up 1% per year. 25% of men now under 40 have erectile dysfunction, a quarter of the country. You know, this is fundamentally a metabolic disease. We've got 77% of young Americans can't serve in the military because of obesity or drug abuse. We've got, we've got autoimmune diseases. Some studies are saying they're going up 13% per year. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's really unbelievable. And I could go through so many more diseases. Of course, um, we've got heart disease, which is almost totally preventable as the leading cause of death in the United States, killing around 800,000 people per year. Um, and I think what, as I kind of just looked around, and again, these are just statistics, I started trying to put the pieces together. 
why is this happening? Why are these all going up all at once? And there is a problem. There is a fundamental breaking of our core cellular biology that is caused by our diet and the world we're living in, the modern world we're living in today, that is crushing the very way that the human body and our human cells can transmit food energy to life energy, to cellular energy. And it's basically like all of us are a little bit dead while we're alive. This is what most Americans innocently put into their bodies these days and most alarmingly into the bodies of their children. And it's no coincidence that Americans die earlier than Canadians or Germans or Italians or Japanese or Koreans or Australians or most any other comparable country. And it wasn't always that way until the early 1990s. Our life expectancy was the same or better than other developed countries. Then suddenly, more and more Americans began suffering from chronic diseases, from obesity, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and all kinds of autoimmune diseases. Our maternal mortality rate soared to the highest of any developed country on earth. Same with infant mortality. Like the frog in the slowly boiling water, we didn't really notice as we got sicker and sicker. We've grown now to accept chronic disease conditions as normal. But now, in 2024, we're finally waking up to this cataclysm and we're asking ourselves, how in the world did this happen? A big part of it is our diet. Restaurants that serve contaminated food are fined or shut down. But when it's the government that approves the poisons in our food, a few people get very, very rich, and the toxins end up in every supermarket aisle. Let me show you what I mean. Doritos, Cheez-Its, Cap'n Crunch, gummy bears. Everyone knows that these are junk foods, so maybe you wouldn't be too surprised to see that the ingredients include a lot of poisons, including a harmful yellow dye called tetrazine, or yellow dye number five. What you may not know is that this dye was originally made out of the sludge that's left over when you turn coal into coke for blast furnaces. It's called coal tar, and I've actually sued many big industries for legacy contamination of coal tar all around the country because it's so toxic and it's so harmful to the environment and human beings. A century ago, it was just an obnoxious industrial byproduct that everybody was trying to figure out ways to get rid of. One of the ways that they did that was by paving roads. But then a British chemist figured out that the coal tar could be used to derive fabric dye. And if fabric dye, why not food? Food manufacturers began using it to cover up the discoloration of low quality foods that they wanted to pass off on unsuspecting customers. They didn't know back then that this yellow dye, tartrazine, causes tumors, asthma, developmental delays, neurological damage, ADD, ADHD, hormone disruption, gene damage, anxiety, depression, intestinal injuries. Well, we know it now. We've known this for decades. That's why tartrazine is heavily restricted in other countries. In some countries, foods with tartrazine have a warning label that it may cause ADHD in children. Today, it's made from petroleum, not coal tar. Either way, it's crazy to add this to your kid's favorite foods. It doesn't even change the flavor. This yellow dye isn't just in junk food. It's in the foods that we consider healthy. It's in everyday kids' snacks like popcorn, mac and cheese, fruit snacks. It's in sports drinks like Gatorade and so-called vitamin water. It's even added to chicken broth, to corn, to pickles, to mustard, and to yogurt. And so, of course, our kids get sick. And we lovingly feed them chewable vitamins, which have, surprise, tartrazine. And so the cycle continues until the coughs and asthma kick in, at which point you go to pick up some cough syrup. And yeah, you guessed it, tartrazine. I've been picking on tartrazine today, but that's just one of at least 100 chemical poisons that our health agencies allow into our children's food. I can make a video just like this to talk about Red 40, BHA, BHD, potassium bromate, chemical after chemical, and on and on and on. If just one of them can cause all of these problems, imagine what they're doing in combination. That has never been studied. If we took all of these chemicals out, our nation would get healthier immediately. So we have to ask the question, why would America purposefully poison its own population? Why would America, who's supposed to be, you know, 
uh, have a good relationship with the population. It's a democratic society. Why would this country be willing to allow their population to be poisoned? But this goes back to what we said before. The number one export of American um, of the American industries is the defense industry. All goes back to defense. So every single time that you see the government exploiting the people, it all goes back and trickles up to the defense contractors. So believe it or not, they are purposely trying to kill their own people in order to put you into debt and make you basically surrender yourself to a medical establishment that will continue to suck you dry. Even if you have insurance, your insurance is literally being sucked dry. They need these type of capitalist exploits, not just inside of healthcare, but also in the prison industries, all of these different industries. They need these exploits in order to rejuvenate the American economy so that this big behemoth known as the military industrial complex can continue to function and reign over all of the world. So when you look at what's happening right now inside of the world, you have two possibly big wars that are going to be having the United States on the front lines literally would be World War III if they come into fruition. And what do you have fueling it? The military industrial complex. But who's really fueling that complex? It's the American people whose bodies are being leveraged in order to prop up this defense industry. So I wanted to give you all of that so that you can understand the fact that we are literally being depleted by the system so that the system can actually achieve its real spiritual purpose, the purpose of for why this Babylon system exists. Now, I want to go back to the concept of owning nothing and being happy because all the while, while you're being exploited, while you're being sucked dry, which they want you to not question it. They want you to accept it. They want you to go along with it. Meanwhile, they are making decisions around you. They're making decisions around who, where you're going to live, planning where you're going to live. They're planning what you're going to eat. They're planning what you are going to be subjected to. While you are basically continuing to prop up this machine, the machine is making plans about how you will live. Now, when you hear you'll own nothing and be happy, you have to also go back to the fact that, again, we ha don't really own much. Debt is not ownership, right? If you own your house, you're a homeowner, but you're paying a monthly mortgage, you're really not owning the house. The bank owns the house. If you pay a car loan, you really don't own your car. The, the bank owns the car. And you find this out if you default and if they decide to seize the house or they decide to seize the car, you find out that, yeah, I really don't own these things. I'm actually just basically a renter of these things. But I have equity, and equity obviously is better than nothing. So similarly, though, you have people inside of the American industry. Look at this article right here. A lot of people cannot even get to that equity. A lot of people are being forced to be renters as of now because of how bad the economy is. And when you think about how much you actually can own inside of America, it's very little because every single place where you go, you have to basically burden yourself with debt. And if you are not one of those people who can necessarily just pay it off, then you are not going to be free to move about and do things how you want to be, how you want to achieve them. So think with all of that, how we have been completely um, brought into this idea, maybe not even knowing it, thinking that ownership is good, but not really living that and experiencing it for real. And think about that while I go through this article, you will own nothing and be happy. So this is from the World Economic Forum's website. Again, the article is called, Here's How Life Could Change in My City by 2030. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say our city? I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own appliances or any clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in the city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. And I want to emphasize that everything that is a product becomes a service. That is the thing that a lot of us might miss. So, for example, I watched one video. He gave a really good explanation of this. He's talking about iPhones, and I have an iPhone. And the fact that if you think about having an iPhone, you really own your iPhone. Because if you don't know, at some point, your iPhone battery is probably going to get really, really weak to the point where you're like, okay, 
I want to just get a new battery. Well, I remember the days where you could just buy a new battery, pop it into your phone and go about your day. Those days don't exist anymore. I cannot open my phone. I cannot get in to get my battery. And that is intentionally that way. They can intentionally make the phones difficult to open. And even if you are able to open them, they make it so that you might damage the actual phone if you trade to own ba- your, the, uh, the battery. So this forces you to make a decision. Are you going to invest in a new phone? Or are you going to just keep going with iPhone? They have these payment plans. The payment plans make it so that everyone can afford a new iPhone. Now, do you see how your ownership of an iPhone is actually you partaking in a service now? You are ongoingly in an agreement, assuming that you don't say, you know what, forget it all. I'm just going to just go to a different type of phone altogether. You are unknowingly in an agreement to basically buy a new iPhone at high cost monthly payments every few years, what, every four years, if you're um, being conservative, right? You are in that agreement and you might not have thought about it, but these are how they put us inside of these agreements because they make us think that ownership and services can be equated. So let's keep going. It says, it may seem odd to you. Um, everything, t- everything you consider a product has now become a service. We have transportation, access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free, so it ended up not making sense for us to own much. First, communication became digitized and free to everyone. Then, when clean energy became free, things started to move quickly. Transportation dropped dramatically in price. It made no sense for us to own cars anymore because we could call a driverless vehicle or a flying car for longer journeys within minutes. We started transporting ourselves in a much more organized and coordinated way when public transport became easier, quicker, and more convenient than the car. Now I can hardly believe that we accepted congestion and traffic jams, not to mention the air pollution from combustion combustion engines. What were we thinking? In our city, we don't pay any rent because someone else is using our free space whenever we do not need it. My living room is used for business meetings when I am not there. Once in a while, I will choose to cook for, cook for myself. It is easy. The necessary kitchen equipment is delivered at my door within minutes. Since transport became free, we stopped having all those things stuffed into our home. Why keep a pasta maker and a crepe cooker crammed into our cupboards? We can just order them when we need them. Now, the funny thing is that It makes sense, right? Because uh, I'll say for me, I've definitely had a history of buying appliances and it's like you don't really use them. For example, I remember I bought an ice cream maker at one point thinking that I was going to start making ice cream. I haven't made ice cream yet, although I do still plan to hopefully. How much sense and ease and convenience would it make for someone to have a subscription and say, okay, I'm just going to rent these little appliances. I don't need to buy anything. I can just rent. I mean, after all, our spaces, the places where we live are becoming smaller and smaller. Why not just rent it and then send it back? You can see how this is alluring. Now, I said this also made the breakthrough of the circular economy easier. When products are turned to services, no one has an interest in things with a short lifespan. Everything is designed for durability, repairability, and recyclability. The materials are flowing more quickly in our economy and can be transformed to new products pretty easily. Environmental problems seem far away since we only use clean energy and clean production methods. The air is clean, the water is clean, and nobody would dare to touch the protected areas of nature because they constitute such value to our well-being. In the cities, we have plenty of, plenty of green space and plants and trees all over. I do not understand why in the past life we filled all three spots in the city with concrete. Shopping. I can't really remember what that is. For most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. Sometimes I find this fun and sometimes I want the algorithm to do it for me. It knows my tastes better than I do now. This is what we're experiencing in real time. When AI and robots took over so much of our work, we suddenly had time to eat well, sleep well, and spend time with other people. The concept of rush hour makes no sense anymore, since the work that we can 
that since the work that we do can be done at any time. I don't really know if I would call it work anymore. It is more than thinking, more like thinking time, creation time, and development time. Now listen to this part. My biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city. Those we lost on the way. Those who decided it, that it became too much. All of this technology. Those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over big parts of our jobs. Those who got upset with the political system and turned against it. They live, it, they live different kind of lives outside of the city. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. Others just stayed in the empty and abandoned houses in the 19th century villages. Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy, nowhere I can go and not be registered. I know that somewhere, everything I do, think and dream is being recorded. I just hope that nobody will use it against me. All in all, it is a good life. Much better than the path that we were on, where it became so clear that we could not continue with the same model of growth. We had all of these terrible things happening. Lifestyle diseases, climate change, the refugee crisis, environmental degradation, completely congested cities, water pollution, air pollution, social unrest, and unemployment. We lost way too many people before we realized that we could do things differently. So this is, I hope you understand how this could be alluring to a lot of people, but I want you to understand this is the embodiment of what the beast system would do. The beast system would provide all your needs does provide your needs, but the perfection of the beast system that they are aspiring to is just this exact thing. They want people to not feel any type of qualms about not owning anything. They want people to not feel qualms about not controlling their lives. Literally, they want you to go through the motions and go through the motions and not have any questions for what they are doing. They want you to surrender your right to privacy. Essentially, they want you to be okay with that. They want you to surrender to censorship. They want you to surrender to this system being the all-knowing one, the one that knows what's best for you and making the decisions for you. So this is literally the perfection of the beast system. And you see how people who do not want to live it like this, they're outside of the city. Oh, I feel bad for those people, right? Oh, poor them. You know, they wanted to be shut out from technology. Poor them. How has technology really improved your quality of life, though? Because what technology does, in this case, this pretend person, technology really robs you from the ability to know basic things, to know how to do basic things. I mean, think about production, right? Um, I'm in a press process right now. I'm like, you know what? I need to learn how to make bread because I don't know how to make bread. And that is something that every single person used to know how to do. Technology has robbed us from that. Production has robbed us from that. We just go to the store and we get these things. Are we really better off, though? If I'm inside of a situation where that system can no longer give to me or will no longer give to me, refuses to give to me because I have not submitted to it, am I in a better place because of technology? No. In that case, technology becomes a weapon. And that's really what we have to understand. AI, technology, all of these things will at some point become a weapon against those who have not learned to live without it. So this is what they have planned for you. Now, as far as how this is actually being implemented, we're not going to get into that in this video. I wanted you to more so understand how we've been teetering into this by submitting to lifestyles where we really don't own much to begin with and teetering towards a life where what she just explained sounds great. Sounds debt free, right? Sounds like burden free. The machines are doing everything. Literally everything's being planned for you. So many things are free. You don't have to worry about the same um, this, about the same burdens that came with living inside of a death economy. This is what they're going to be selling to us. So we have to be understanding whenever we're receiving different conveniences that these conveniences ultimately do come with a price. So that is it for this video. I hope that was um, edifying. I thank you all for watching and y'all willing. I'll see you in the next video. That we don't learn how to grow our own food. How do we trust our oppressor to feed us? And why is it that we got to eat all these GMO seeds? And we don't know how to, we, we don't control the stuff that, 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 that makes us live. We, we don't know who makes our food, our medicine. You know, we generally don't own our buildings. We're here. We're just renting life. And that's the way they want it. And we're not conscious of that. So 
we have to learn the fundamentals and we can't forget that in history we were winning and we can't let them erase that. So even down to the way we interpret the name Jesus, that's a European interpretation of the name. His name is Joshua. Why do we, no one calls me Damien, any, anything but Damien wherever I go in the world. Why would we have to now say somebody's name with a, a, a European interpretation of the name and it didn't happen in Europe? That doesn't make sense other than control. How could you tell, if, if somebody tells me they're a fan of mine and they're calling me Damien, I'm going to be like, my name's Damien. How could you really be a fan of mine? You're not calling me by my real name. So how could you get a full blessing you calling this man by his wrong name? Because we've been programmed to. You understand what I'm saying? It's never going to pay its debts. Uh, it doesn't have to. It can, its debts are in its own currency. We can simply print it. Uh, the African debt is not in its currency. The African debt is in U.S. dollars. Africa has to uh, earn the U.S. dollars, uh, and uh, the only way it can uh, earn the U.S. dollars is not to be assassinated for growing its own food and becoming uh, independent uh, and uh, doing something that the United States uh, does not like. The principle underlying the foundation of the World Bank is that no country should grow its own food. Africa and the third world should only grow export crops to export uh, in order to have an oversupply of cocoa and uh, uh, other tropical raw materials to keep down the price. They must buy their grain from the United States or Europe so that if they do something that we don't like, we can do what America tried to do to China in the 60s. We can sanction them. We can say, we're going to starve you. We're going to not export uh, any grain to you. So owing their foreign uh, debt in dollars means that they have to somehow sell something that the United States wants, not what they want. Uh, I think the, the most evil organizations in the world today are the, uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Problem. Many Zimbabweans think that Zimbabwe is not able to produce food now because of the drought and because farms were taken from white farmers and given to black farmers. That is not the truth. The truth is Zimbabweans are failing to produce because it used to cost a Zimbabwean farmer, a small-scale black farmer in Zimbabwe, zero cents and just labor to produce a hectare of food. But today, these Zimbabwean farmers were persuaded by companies like Seedco to get rid of their traditional seeds that used to be able to reproduce and they were given these hybrids that do not reproduce or that continue to have reducing reproduction until they stop reproducing. Now the Zimbabwean farmer doesn't have that seed that can reproduce. So every season, the Zimbabwean farmer must go and buy new seeds. And these hybrids do not just grow, but they need fertilizers and chemicals to make them grow. So the Zimbabwean farmer must buy new seeds every season, fertilizer and pesticides to protect these hybrids. So now to produce a hectare in a village costs a farmer nothing less than 250 US dollars to buy the seeds together with the fertilizer for him to grow the food. This is a problem that is causing Zimbabwe to lose its food self-sufficiency. And the problem is that all the PhD graduates, master's degree graduates, and graduates that are teaching our people how to farm in Zimbabwe come from an education system created by the very same organizations in America that are selling these hybrid seeds and chemicals so that's why we are in a cycle where we continue to produce food unsustainably in zimbabwe listening to graduates right now the permanent secretary of agriculture in zimbabwe i think his name is john basera came from this company called seedco that is owned by lima grain of france while lima grain of france is owned by monsanto the American company that is the biggest producer of GMOs and chemicals that are used in farming. 
These very same organizations work with an institution in which Strive Masiwa was the chairman that is called AGRA, that belongs to the Rockefeller Foundation together with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to control food in the world and to ensure that Africa comes into food colonialism. This institution was started by Kofi Annan so that they could get the trust of Africans to control African food and to put Africa into food colonization. The main reason I speak against Strive Masiwa is because he is bringing food colonialism to Africa through these GMOs, hybrids, and all this that they call agricultural technology of chemicals that destroys our soils and destroys Africa's ability to reproduce food. These are the things that we are supposed to start talking about when we are talking about emancipation of Africa and economic emancipation of Africans. There is no independence in Africa if your food is controlled by the Americans, the Swiss, and the Germans.